Well, still on The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa, thanks for joining us this beautiful Tuesday morning. Chris Kende Wandu de-troubleized Nigeria. He joins us, uh, you know, to bring great perspective on the papers. Chris, it's good to have you join us. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> I mean, what, what attire are you wearing and what culture does it represent? You know, I moved from east to west to north and this one is a traditional Yoruba outfit. That's what I'm putting down. Well, that's great. All right, we'll start off with the Punch newspaper. Uh, looking at the big stories, we'll also have uh, the leadership, the Nigerian Tribune, all things being equal, the nation as well. The Punch says, Queen Elizabeth's funeral. World leaders, f over 4 billion audience, bid farewell. It was really uh, a historic event. Trust, Boris Johnson, Tony Blair, four others, ex-Prime Minister pay last respect. Uh, former President Lucia Guno Basanjo, Eulages, uh, late queen, says she carried herself with dignity. We look forward to a prosperous reign, uh, Vice President Yemi Osibajo tells King Charles III. Away from that, you have Buhari to launch $100 billion SDG financial or financing framework. And National Assembly resumes 2023 budget. Chief Judge of Nigeria's confirmation or justice, top agenda. National Assembly's resumption starts with the 2023 budget and uh, the confirmation of the Chief uh, Judge or Chief Justice of Nigeria as a top agenda. NDLEA seizes 194 billion naira cocaine in Lagos, arrest five. And Nigeria's second quarter debt hits four trillion naira amid revenue crisis. Corruption running Nigeria, I take that again. Corruption ruining Nigeria fuels subsidy organized crime. OB is quoted than that. And SAN's react as Evans, ex soldier, bags 21 years in prison. Student target a papa port after airport road blockage. So, uh, you know, that's what it is. Yesterday we saw that the airport was actually, uh, road was blocked or the airport activities leading to that was disrupted by that protest by students. PDP, Autumn wants Atiku. Fire chase used for peace. This is uh, the banner caption or the bold stories this morning on the punch. You have the Nigerian Tribune uh, in front of us this morning. Reps raises alarm over plot to sink Nigeria through fuel subsidy. Says we're subsidizing neighboring countries. President PMS crosses to Cameroon through the Northeast. PMS gets to... Uh, Mall and neighboring countries hardly import PMS. In fact, some of them do not have the LLC cover to back up import. If you go to Niger Republic, you will find that PMS is sold in bottles like Coca Cola. Uh, that's what uh, Ibrahim Mustafa, Honorable Minister, quoted to say. It's like a lengthy statement underneath the issue right there. ASU strikes student protest and ground activities at Lagos Airport. And they're also saying that they're going to take that, you know, to the seaports. Sets for showdown with police over planned showdown of Iloring Airport. No plan to shut Abuja Airport, Nan says. There's own protests in Lagos, really. <laughs> Reps leadership to meet federal government, ASU delegation today. NDLEA bust cocaine warehouse and seizes... 193 billion naira worth of drugs in Ikorodu. A van to spend 21 years in jail for kidnapping. And placeholder running mate caught strikes out PDP suit against Tunubu and Obi. And Zaitia's INEC unveils final list of presidential National Assembly candidates today. And the commission dismisses claim of 7 million disenfranchised Nigerians. Uh, that's the conversation we had. World leaders with us, Queen Elizabeth's grand burial. And uh, that might just be dominating all of the papers. 
but that's it on the Nigerian Tribune. And away from that, we have uh, we have the nation, and just before the nation, we'll just quickly take a look at the we'll take a look at the uh, the leadership newspaper this morning. Queen Elizabeth the Second World Beads final farewell to Her Majesty. Students shut down Lagos Airport over strike. There's several riders right there. Court rules on Friday's suit on Wednesday. Bandit abducts 60 and kill four in Niger. Uh, Kaduna and demand 200 million naira. NDLA uncovers 193 billion naira worth of cocaine at Lagos Warehouse. And uh, that's uh, what you find there on uh, the leadership newspaper. Uh, we take a quick look at the nation. The nation says federal government planned salary increase to cushion inflation effects. Oshomale knocks governors not paying 30,000 naira monthly wage. I mean, so we're still talking about the implementation of, you know, the minimum wage, 30,000 as was requested. Bishop Coker, I pay 30 million naira ransom for my priests. That's interesting. Evans Jill, 21 years for kidnapping and collecting $420,000. And just before we move away from uh, the nation newspaper, you have uh, students block Lagos Airport over ASU and PDP crisis dismisses weak-case dangerous or Tom Wands. Okay, uh, this is the riders you find. And just before then, the NDLA sees 193 billion drug raid of the Lagos Warehouse. Uh, these are some of the headlines you find this morning. On the Nation newspaper, we have Chris Kende Wandu who joins the conversation. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you once again for having me. Well, let's start off with the Nigerian Tribune. Reps raise alarm over plot to sink Nigeria through fuel subsidy. What are your thoughts? My thought is what I've always said. Um, the issue of subsidy is uh, killing the nation as it were currently. And um, the burden on us uh, is just too uh, is just too much that for now we are finding it difficult. Apart from the subsidy, we are finding it even much more difficult to be able to service the the, the huge debt that is on us. Uh, we can't, we keep on borrowing on a daily basis as if uh, borrowing is going out of existence. The national legislative body, the national uh, national assembly. Senate and the House of Reps passes whatever the executive brings to them over borrowing. We are not producing more. We are not exporting more. Um, even our quota with, uh, with OPEC, we cannot meet. Now we are losing over 400,000 barrels of oil on a daily, um, crude oil on a daily basis to theft. And uh, that, that is a true picture of what is happening now. And uh, the federal government seems um, to doesn't even know what to do again. Recently, they signed a contract of over, over, over 40 or 45 billion with the Tompolo for the provision of security on our various pipelines. But this only happen, and we continue saying this every time we come on television that if we have done what we need to do, we want to be where we are today. Nigeria obviously is the only country in uh, among the OPEC. Uh, countries, a uh, country that produces crude oil, they still import petroleum products. No country does that. What we do is that we produce crude oil exports, then we import um, petroleum products. And the issue is that if we have done what we need to do by making sure that our refineries are working, we won't be finding ourselves where we are today. You see, some people are so comfortable with what is happening between government, NMPC, and others to make sure that the refineries don't work. They'll continue to tell you, oh, it will work in December. It will come up in January. It will come up five years, eight years down the line. This government promised when it was being elected in 2015 that all the refineries would be revived and new ones would be built. No single, or, no single um, 
the refinery is working currently as it were. And the most uh, annoying part of it, message is the fact that we see the norm, well, if what we budget for turnaround maintenance every year, I ask where is that money going to? What do they use that money? The, those working in these refineries are collecting billions and billions of naira um, on, a year, on a yearly basis and cannot refine a single fuel. So that is uh, Nigeria for you. But look at what happened in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, President Ruto was sworn in last week and immediately he removed, he saw the problem his country was going to, and he removed the subsidy. And they say that, uh, uh, and that was the way we just have to face this. And we are, we, are, we are ready, either we are ready to do the right thing or we'll continue to uh, go about it. But to me, I'll repeat, some people are benefiting in billions and billions of dollars uh, with what is happening with the issue of oil subsidy and the inability to make our refineries work. Well, uh, Chris, would it be also okay, I mean, still looking at the, the Nigerian Tribune, the fact that it will be difficult for us to uh, remove, I mean, to continue with the fuel subsidy regime while we're subsidizing for other countries, neighboring countries. Yeah, yes, because once you subsidize that, then other countries is going to affect all those, uh, all these, um, uh, 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 leakages here and there that we find. You see that, you remember what the controller, the controller general of customs said? He said that NPC cannot justify the number of about 65 million or close to 90 million, uh, 85 million liters of fuel that is being released into, uh, that he claims is being released into the system on a daily basis, that they cannot, that they cannot justify that. Because over the years, we've also find out that even we, 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 you cannot say that this is the true consumption, the level of consumption, because about 30 million of that cannot be accounted for. And I suppose about this issue of most of these truck moving out of the country, out of the country to neighboring countries and rest of them. So we are not only subsidizing uh, um, the uh, petroleum products, we're also subsidizing for um, Countries around us, Niger, Chad, Cameroon, and the rest of them, just like that report said, that most of these petroleums find their way out of the country through the north into Cameroon and other parts of, uh, of the country. And you continue to ask yourself, who are those behind this? NPC knows what's going on. The Ministry of Petroleum knows what, uh, knows what is going on. Even, I will not say that, even the president himself, who is the Minister of Petroleum, don't forget that President Mohamed Buhari is the Minister of Petroleum. So if there's a failure in that sector, all blame should go to the Minister of Petroleum, who is President Mohamed Buhari. He cannot claim not to know what is going on and know what to do. Another one is the protest by Nance. I mean, yesterday, uh, the road to the airport, so you want to say there was gridlock around uh, the Murtala Mohamed Airport right in Lagos. And they're also threatening that they would embark on other protests where they would take it, you know, to... Uh, very prominent areas. I mean, we're talking about transportation uh, access or access roads right there. What are your thoughts on this protest? And do you think that it was it's really a rational thing to do by Nance? What other option do they have? They have begged. They have begged the federal government. They have begged ASU. These are students that have been home for over eight months now. Before this, they lost about uh, 11 months uh, last year or there about. Before that, the COVID set in and they lost practically another uh, almost one year. Now, over the months, they have been appealing to the federal government to look into the crisis, uh, the problem with ASU, so that the schools can be resumed, uh, so that they can go back to school. They have begged, they have tried, they have done anything, everything humanly possible. The government doesn't seem to be listening to them. Then they are taking, the, the, they are taking their destiny into their hands. Since the government is not ready to listen, what would they do? They have only, the only thing they have is the power of protest. And nobody has the right to stop anybody from protesting or agitating when it comes to the issue of protest. The only thing that the law abhors is that, that protest turning violence. They started with the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. They moved to uh, the airport uh, road yesterday. And they also continue threatening that uh, they are going to move to other places. Government knows that what to do is go back to what I've said before. And the only person that can solve the issue of 
ASU presently is the president of the Republic of Nigeria. That issue of negotiation, that power to negotiation, to bring um, ASU um, to agree on most of the terms have been thrown out of the window. Don't forget that federal government had gone to uh, the uh, industrial court, and then the industrial court in the next few hours is going to um, uh, come out with a judgment or a pronouncement on that suit. And the question I've always asked is, even if they ask ASU members to go back to work and they refuse to go back to work, what can the court do? They cannot do anything. You cannot force a, 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 a laborer or on a, an employee on, a, a, an, a, on an employer. If he decides not to work, there's nothing you can do about it. Best you can do is to stop the salary, which they have done. And um, part of the agitation of ASU is that they want, to, they want to be paid. The federal government is saying that it is no work, no pay. That has already been stipulated. So the students, I, in as much as I don't like the way I'm mad I go about it, they have no other option than to support what they are doing because that is the only thing they, they can do, protest on their own, whether they're blocking the road, blocking the airport, or blocking anywhere. There is nothing anybody can do about it. Let the government do the needful. You had an agreement, a contract signed with ASU, and once that contract has been signed, in as much as it's not cast on soul, it is within you to make sure that the tenants of that um, uh, contract um, is obeyed. The government will come to say, oh, we didn't sign it. It was signed by the previous government. Government is a continuum. Whenever you inherit a company, as we say in company law, you inherit both assets and the liabilities. And that is the true situation now. So um, uh, there's nothing anybody can do about it than to make sure that this issue is totally resolved as quickly as possible so that we don't continue to get ourselves into People have forgotten easily how the NSA uh, protest started. It started like this. And the foreground government has forgotten what happened during the NSA. This was how it started. Before you knew it, it was spread out across the country and we're going to have serious insecurity on our hands. And I hope they'll be able to need this in the board as quickly as possible by making sure that the issue between the federal government and also is resolved. Well, so, uh, I mean, for, the, for me, the concern would be what results have we actually uh, gotten from all of this protest? As much as it's within their right uh, to protest, they have a right to uh, an assembly as long as they don't constitute a nuisance or, I mean, they're not a threat to national security. But however, we know that this is not the first time that, you know, Nance has protested. We talked about the Lagos Ibadan way, the greed lock that it costs. And, and after what, what happened? Now we're having the airports being blocked. Yesterday, I mean, or the roads to the airports being blocked. And, and that also, you know, was quite stressful. Let's look at the fact that this is also contributing to economic loss. We know what happens when you have a greed lock. Uh, these passengers who are going about their businesses or, you know, ordinary citizens who are going about their businesses, should they be taking, you know, the brunt and the, the pain for all of this? That's on the one hand. There's also another plan to have another protest. You know, students are saying they're going to shut down the Loring Airport. And the police is actually also appealing that, hey, they can't go that way. Has protest really been a tool to resolve conflict or has it, has it really pressured government's hand to act in a certain, you know, direction? And the question I ask again, what other options is left to the students? Until somebody come out um, with a, a much better um, argument, then that is the only option that is left to them. Well, you are talking about whether it affects, whether it has any effect or not. It does. It's a national embarrassment. Um, the world is seeing what is happening. And the world is taking notes. It's a, it's a global village. Whatever happened in Lagos is a, I've been seen and read in Washington, it has been read in London, uh, it has been read across the globe and have been seen across the globe. And that puts the Nigerian government in terrible bad light because the, a government that cannot handle just the basic elements, uh, issue like education, has no place in governance. And that is it. If you cannot handle simple issues like um, uh, uh, students, um, lecturers, um, uh, strike, and rest of it. You have no, we have, we're not even talking of the big, bigger world. We are not talking about insecurity now. That in itself is a much, much bigger world. But education, there are basic things that is required of a government. A government has to provide social amenities 
has to build infrastructure, has also look at education. Is there is no country in the world where the education system is taken lightly, because these are the future. These are our future leaders. If you fail to get them educated today, they are going to have problems tomorrow. So every country across the globe. There are some countries in the world where education is totally free. And Messi, let me shock you more. Most of these leaders that we're having now, those of them well, within the health service, most of them were beneficiaries of the free education of Nigeria, of this federal, of Nigeria. Most of them went through uh, the system in the Southwest, in the Southwest, in the North, where education was free. Most of their parents could not afford to pay their school fees and they had the benefit of going to school free. If they didn't have that opportunity, they wouldn't have been where they are today. And that is very, very sad. So what, what, uh, you ask yourself, what are the options are left to the students? Are they, you want them to carry gun, or you want them to start killing people, or you want them to start kidnapping people, or you want them to start destroying uh, uh, government infrastructures, or start burning down houses and the rest of them. That's nothing they've done. All they did was just protest, block roads and the rest of them. In other climes, it could be worse, or they can even get you worse. So what, that is why I'm saying that why it is as quietly as this, as simple as this, let us make sure we resolve this issue before this crisis gets out of control. We are having serious, um, uh, serious um, uh, uh, security problems. Some people, so that people, some uh, uh, undesirable elements will not take advantage of this process to, come, uh, to cause more havoc within the system. And that is what I'm saying. But um, you know recently that as the federal government has made an offer to ASU and uh, ASU has not really accepted that offer. You also want to begin to look at that current reality. A budget deficit, we're, we're, we're faced with a deficit of 6.26 trillion naira, which is also forcing the government to new borrowings of uh, 5.012 trillion naira, of which domestic, you have domestic borrowings of uh, 2.506 trillion naira and a foreign uh, you know, borrowing at almost two trillion or thereabout, and so looking at all of this, is is it not rational? Uh, you're you're already seeing we're seeing the dynamics and how things are being played out. Uh, quota production has been reduced. We're faced with revenue issue, and how can the government respond to all of these issues? At the beginning, I, I make a statement and I make a comparison with what happened in the oil sector. And I said that billions and billions of dollars have been pumped into the turnaround maintenance of our refineries, and no single refinery has been turned around. We need a, 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 a society to say that this is time for agencies like EFCC and ICPC to turn their satellite on what is happening in the Ministry of Petroleum, NNPC, other, uh, other it has been, uh, uh, what do they call it, you know, privatized or not. Those wastages can be used to be able to sort out these issues that um, Asu is talking about. You pump billions and billions of dollars, I'm not saying Naira, billions of dollars into a sector that is non, that is producing absolutely nothing. So what are we talking about? There are so many other critical areas where leakages here and there. We saw, we read about ghost workers that we have uncovered recently, we have billions and billions of Naira we have been, we, we have been stolen by civil servants under the same government. We have seen a situation where the Accountant General of Nigeria stole billions and billions of Naira under the same government. We have seen situations where so many other government officials and agencies are, are getting involved in graft and issues that have borders on, uh, 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 on stealing and the rest of them. If governments in his wisdom have been able to do the need for some of this money, how can be channeled into our education sector? I won't be having this problem. So when you continue to say, oh, we don't have the money, we don't. Yes, we don't have the money. But you can still be tactical about it. Yes, I agree that the federal government has been able to agree to uh, a salary increase of about close to 23 to 23% uh, or thereabouts for university lecturers and about 35% for um, professors in the universities. But it does not end there because there are so many other issues that have been. I personally also feel that, yes, in as much as we are also blaming and asking God, also in this wisdom, also should be able to come down to the round table to be able to look at these areas. The way it's going, it's obvious that the federal government cannot be able to agree to everything as we have said. 
But do we even know what has been agreed and what has not been agreed? The government is saying say something else, as we say something else. And that is why, as I remember the last time I was talking on this program, I say it has gone beyond the federal government. And as well. We should look at opportunity of having a third party. The government cannot solve this problem from obvious and is asking that is a problem with as we can have. Can we look at third parties like those into arbitration, those into mediation and conciliation to come in and be as a bridge between in this negotiation that so that something tangible can come out of it. As it is going, it is going to be very difficult for ASO and the federal government to resolve it. Despite the fact they've gone to court, even the government, if the court make a pronouncement in the next few days, how are we sure that ASO, ASO is going to abide by that? And if they don't, what will you do? Are you going to arrest all members of ASO? It's not possible. Okay. Um, so so the, there are two issues as we coast it down now. One is on the punch, uh, the top of the punch paper. It talks about Nigerians' second quarter uh, you know, debt hits 42 trillion naira. I mean, revenue crisis. And that's it. That's on the punch now. But it feels like the way out for us is more borrowing. We feel like we have to continue to borrow to solve the problem. Uh, what do you make of this? And on the nation, the nation talks about um, inflation now. The government is saying we're going to increase salary to cushion the effect of inflation. Uh, is it almost the same thing as printing money to help solve the problem? Uh, what are your thoughts, really? My thoughts basically is that we're just going in visual circle. Government know what to do. Uh, if, we are, if we tend to make sure that uh, we have a turnaround, uh, depending over dependence of oil is not helping us. We have to produce more. We have to export more. That is only where we can make uh, earnings. And there are so many critical areas uh, of the economy that we can be able to catch. We are looking at the mineral. We are looking at the agriculture. We are looking at um, uh, critical areas like even information technology. Uh, if we move in these areas, then there's a possibility that we'll be able to get more. And uh, our problem is cash crunch. But even at that, I say time and time again that he who goes a borrowing goes a sorry. If you continue to borrow on a daily basis and um, you, you, you run into problem, what we're, the problem now, Messi, is not even what we are borrowing. The problem is that all we are having, we are using it to service our debts. Not only servicing debt, not the main debt, we are servicing most often than not the interest on this debt and it's keep on piling. That is the issue that uh, we, we, where we find ourselves. So, we should put up our thinking cap. The fact also means it looks as if um, that uh, we are running into a situation where the government doesn't even know what to do as far as this issue is concerned. But quickly, uh, that is for the economy. But quickly, uh, let me just talk quickly on the sentencing of um, advance yesterday, the so-called billionaire uh, uh, kidnapper uh, who was sentenced to 21 years imprisonment yesterday in Lagos. That, for me, is a, a way forward. And it's, it's a clear... A indication to all those that are going into crimes that no matter how you try to run away from uh, justice, justice will definitely catch up with you one day. Um, so that is one. And um, we also look forward to a situation where all those that have been arrested by the federal government for, um, for banditry, kidnapping, killings, and the rest of them are also brought to judgment. The pro what we always face is that we make so much noise about arrest and the rest of them. At the end of it all, nothing comes out of it. The federal government has named, said that they're going to name certain people that are involved with um, banditry, kidnapping, killings, Boko Haram, and the rest of them for years. And their sponsors for years now, no single person has been brought to book or has been uh, brought to judgment or has been um, brought to the courts. And that in itself is fueling this level of insecurity. Until we hold people responsible for their actions, then we cannot run away from the problem, uh, solving the problem of insecurity in Nigeria. So for me, the judgment of the courts uh, in Lagos yesterday over advance and the issue of kidnapping is com commendable for me. All right, Chris, uh, this will just be the final one because we're out of time. Uh, I would just you know, anticipate that you probably returned from uh, London yesterday, central London to be precise, we had all of this, <laughs> you know, bidding the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, farewell. Uh, it was a historic yeah. event. We saw uh, a lot of persons who were represented, global leaders and what have you. But what really stood out is the fact that six countries were not represented and others had some diplomatic, you know, uh, 
invitation. Uh, but uh, these countries, we talk about uh, Russia, Belarus, Syria, uh, Venezuela, and Afghanistan. And the reasons are not, you know, away from what it is. You talk about the issue of the coup uh, that happened, you know, last year. And uh, for Russia, you talk about the invasion and what have you. Uh, what are your thoughts, really? Lack of diplomatic relations with this country. Messi, you have the right to who come to your house. You have the right. It's not everybody that you can invite to your house. It's your discretion. It's your, it doesn't matter whatever the person feels. If I don't want you to come to my house, are you going to force yourself to come to my house? I could you can't. Up. <laughs> so, I, I could show up at the gate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In international politics, there's what is called international politics. And it goes along, it goes different ways. If the, uh, the government in United Kingdom is that this, um, these are not friendly, they call unfriendly nations in international politics. If they see that they are unfriendly nations, then not to stop them from, um, stop them from, uh, stopping them from coming to London. They don't want to see them. You are not afraid. If you are not my friend, you are not my friend. You are, it's either you are my enemy. Or, and if, when you are the friend to my enemy, you are also an, an enemy. So that is what is happening with Belarus and the rest of them. We've seen what is going on between Russia and, and, and Ukraine, where a country invaded a sovereign nation. And that in itself is not. But good enough, the wife of the president of um, Ukraine was invited. She was there to represent Ukraine and her husband and so many other countries. But the laugh, you know, so many things goes on in social media nowadays that you just laugh over it. You saw what was going on in social media yesterday. We had the same president Biden came with his uh, with his uh, own vehicle and all African leaders. I thought we were going to leave that. <laughs> exactly. So people are believing that they were pushing to a bus. In fact, they came up imposed a picture of the Zimbabwe president driving a bus. It, it, it was it was really is, risky, you know. It, it was just risky. I mean, just imagine that uh, there's there's actually an attack. It could probably just wipe out all the African. You know, president yes, and leaders, just because imagine. Of, yes, but because, that is because of logistics. They, there's nothing they can do about it. But the laughable one is where you saw a picture where they said the Zimbabwe president was one driving one of the buses. That's so ridiculous. <laughs> not, not we we need to go now, Chris. That is social media for you. <laughs> yes, we need to go. Thank you so much. It's been fun and quite engaging. Uh, we appreciate your perspective right here every other time. We look forward to sharing your thoughts next week. Thank you so much, Chris Kane, the Wandu. Uh, for being part of the show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And my regards to be on the rest of the team. All right, that's it on Off the Press. Uh, we'll take a break now to let you know what happened today in history. When we return, we'll continue with the conversation right here. Please stay with us. <laughs>